Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Thank you, David, and Adrian as well. Uh, by the way, real quickly, uh, Miss Don, you know, Don Ferguson, he's, uh, he's gone. You know, I got to show you this very quickly. He, you know, he had his little leather hobby. Um, he created, he worked with leather, and he actually made this little notebook, I guess, a number of years ago. And, uh, you know, this is the best gift I have ever been given. Except for eternal life, obviously. But, <laughs> but uh, so every time I open up my little notebook, I think of Don, and I got to tell you, he accidentally cut his himself when he was making this thing, so I still have his blood stain right here. <laughs> so it, it was. I tell you that it, it you don't uh, you can't appreciate how how precious it is when his own blood was shed. <laughs> anyway, First uh, Corinthians chapter two and. Um, for the time that we have, and, and we, we have about 35 minutes. Um, my session here uh, deals with the, the issue of the uh, wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God. And so what we're going to look at here is uh, found in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So let's read the opening verses of chapter 2, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Father, again, we do thank you for your grace and goodness. We thank you that we can come together and study your word. May we allow it to minister to the realm of our inner man. May we have greater understanding and insight regarding how it is you work today and uh, how it is we can have a faith that is grounded and, and anchored uh, on the power of your word we pray that our time together we would be profitable uh, as well as encouraging. And we ask it, of course, in Christ Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Obviously, we're talking about the wisdom of the world, which, of course, God has rendered as foolishness. I like what David said. It's garbage. <laughs> and uh, that's a, a very nice way of uh, referring to the wisdom of this world. In fact, interestingly enough, Go to chapter 1, verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20, where is the scribe uh, wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dispute of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Drop down to verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Notice, to bring to naught. So when Paul is contrasting these two systems... Number one, you have the foolishness of the world. You have the wisdom of the world, which is uh, uh, perpetuating the lie. And uh, when we look at the issue of the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of men, the wisdom of words, what we find is this first system that is grounded in the satanic policy of evil, the course of this world, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, the God of this world who has blinded the minds of them which believe not. How does Satan accomplish that? How does he keep ignorant people, spiritually ignorant people, how does he keep those that are lost blind? Well, he utilizes this system of words. You see, Satan uses enticing words. If you drop down to chapter 2, verse um, uh, 4, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's 
wisdom. So Paul, he, he has a great deal to say about these words. So the first system, which would be worldly in nature, utilizes enticing words. It's the lie program is advanced. It's perpetrated. It's, 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 uh, it, adva it advances based upon words. Okay, well now, of course, what God is pleased to do, we mentioned last evening, verse 21, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So God now is countering this first system, which utilizes human wisdom, the wisdom of this world, and the wisdom of worlds, which again just simply perpetuates the lie with his own system. And his own system is, of course, what brings the greatest delight, the greatest pleasure to Almighty God. God counters the lie program with what? With the truth. That, by the way, is how God is destroying. Go to verse 19 of chapter 1. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. How is God going to destroy the wisdom of the wise? With the truth. If you drop down once again, we, already, we won't read the whole verse, but in verse 27, you see the word confound. In fact, Paul uses it a couple of times in verse 27. How is it that God is going to confound the wise? How is it that God is going to confound the things that are mighty? The word confound, we don't use it, uh, you know, commonly. Uh, I mean, we use the word confound. Fascinating, the Oxford English Dictionary defines the word confound as to cause surprise and confusion by acting against someone's expectations. Think about that for a second. You think about the wisdom of God. Oh, by the way, also verse 28, base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught. Now, we read earlier uh, about God who is going to uh, bring to nothing, verse 19, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The idea of bringing to naught, it's actually a British word, it's an English word, Oxford English Dictionary. It defines the idea of bringing something to naught as overthrowing or ruining a scheme or a plan. Again, fascinating, again, the excellency of the King James English, right? How we need to value and appreciate the words that, that, that are used, the word confound. It carries with it the ultimate overthrow and defeat of a plan, of a purpose, of an aim, of some expectations, God is destroying, he is literally defeating, he's overthrowing, and he's going to ruin the satanic lie program, utilizing a system of words to advance it by truth. And God advances the truth via the foolishness of preaching. In fact, chapter 2 is going to demonstrate that God uses words. In fact, go to chapter 2 and notice there in verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. You see, Paul, he's, he's focusing in on, on, on these words, a, a system uh, of vocabulary that is being utilized to enforce and buttress and affirm human wisdom. Now, we need to recognize something about the wisdom of this world. 
we go to, go to Ephesians chapter 2. I've kind of referred to it, Ephesians chapter 2. When we talk about the wisdom of this world, we need to be mindful, for example, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We're going to talk tonight, uh, my next lesson, which is going to kind of segue, uh, we're going to talk this evening about the spirit of revelation. Here we learn about the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. When the verse talks about the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, don't think of the spirit as being some supernatural entity that sort of possesses a lost person. When we talk about a spirit, it's a reference to a way of thinking. It's a reference to one's attitude about things. It's a reference to one's mental disposition. So there is a spirit that literally courses through unsaved humanity that establishes a way of thinking, a frame of reference, a perspective, a viewpoint, which is all satanic in nature. So the spirit, the way in which the world thinks, is nothing more than the advance of Satan's ultimate lie. And Satan, I'm sorry? It says, the spirit who now but, works in the sons of disobedience. Oh, well, okay. So what can I ask? What translation? And you might have a, a different uh, edition. Uh, New King James. Uh, New King James. Interesting. It says, Well, now there is a difference between who and that. Yes, there is. And uh, my understanding would be the issue is the type of spirit. There is a type of mentality. There is a type of thinking. Okay. Now, for the time being, we can come back and address that. But the King James Bible, verse 2, it's written, the spirit that now works. It's this type, it's a specific way in which the world thinks, okay? Now, the world's way of thinking is a reflection of what the satanic policy, uh, policy of evil is all about. We need to be mindful that the lie, go back to Romans chapter 1, go to Romans chapter 1, and I am moving quickly, obviously, because David hogged all of my time. <laughs> so, Romans chapter 1, and uh, we mentioned this passage last evening, but real quick, Romans chapter 1, remember verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Okay, you know what verse 22 here is referring to? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So read verse 22. Professing themselves to be what? what? Remember what Paul writes? Where's the wise? Where, where, where are they? Where's the scribe? Where is the wise? And what is it that the wise are doing? They become what? Fools. And what does 1 Corinthians chapter 1 deal with? Look at the foolishness of men. Men are in their foolish thinking, professing themselves to be wise, what did they do in verse 23? And changed the glory of the... How do you change the glory of the incorruptible or uncorruptible God? Well, what does 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tells us? Word, the words of man's wisdom. So they profess to be wise, but they become fools. And now they change the, the way humanity changes the glory of God is by teaching something contrary to the truth. So hence, 
Romans chapter 1, verse 23, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men. How do you convince other people that the true God creator of the universe is no different than the man? You got to teach that information. They use enticing words of man's wisdom to convince somebody God is no more, no better, no different than man. Why would, why would somebody... See, there's an entire system out there designed to convince humanity there is no God, obviously. And, and you know what he... How, do you how does someone convince another person that God is like a bird? Or a, foot -foot a four-footed beast? How, how does someone convince another person that God is no bigger, no better, no more glorious than an insect? How does that happen? Listen, the words of man's Wisdom. Now, go there to verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a what? A lie. How do you advance the lie? You teach it. So, now, by the way, uh, hum humanity has become very skilled in advancing the lie utilizing the words of man's wisdom to promote and advance the lie. And it's very sophisticated. And it's built upon intellectualism and, and, and philosophy and so forth. And man has had about 6,000 years of, of, uh, of experience in promoting the lie, utilizing words. Now, Real quick, go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And, and just so that we understand that there is this competing system that is operating in the world, and all it is is the advancement of a lie. You worship the creator of the creature more than the creator. In 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And uh, notice 1 John chapter 2. And verse 16, 1 John 2, verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the what? The world. Remember, the course of this world, the spirit that is working in the children of disobedience. All It is energized, it is driven, it is compelled by this self-serving way of thinking. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the what? The pride of life. Nothing more than a mere reflection of the God of this world. The most self-serving narcissist in the universe, David referred to him, it's Satan. Now, by the way, John's going to talk about that this evening. So, that way of thinking permeates lost humanity. A self-serving, me-first, me-only mentality. Spiritual disposition, a spiritual attitude. It's perpetuated by human wisdom. Now, go to chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 19. Chapter 5, verse 19. Of oh, 1 John. 1 John, chapter 5, 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in what? In wickedness. Go over to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. Go to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. You know, this whole thing about the satanic policy of evil... And, and this lie program, you've heard that expression before. There is this lie program. And that very lie program is, is operating in the world system. And that spirit is operating in lost humanity. Second Thessalonians 
rather interesting how things are going to culminate out there in the future. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now last night, remember we saw there are two categories of people in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. They that perish and they that are saved. Now, this group of people that are going to perish is yet future. But notice what we learn about those who perish. There's a common thread, by the way. I don't care if you're one who perishes in the past, if, if you're in the category of those who perish today, or in the category of those who are going to perish in the future, which is what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is talking about. But, but verse 10 again, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the what? Truth. Now, that's, there's something in common with 1 Corinthians chapter 1. They that perish are those who view the preaching of the cross as what? Foolishness, right? Now, here in the future, those that perish are going to perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth. Somebody once said, the most loving thing that God can ever do is teach you the truth. And so what did the perishing do? Foolishness. They don't receive. And by the way, who is responsible? You notice it's because they receive not the love of the truth. You can't blame God. It is a willful choice on the unbeliever's part. You can receive it or you can reject it. Those who perish are the ones who reject it. Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a what? A lie. That they all might be damned, notice, who believed not the truth. So all I'm getting at is this. Listen, there is this lie program which is ultimately going to culminate, 2 Thessalonians, out there when you have this man of sin, son of perdition, occupying that throne. And, uh, and sadly, uh, those who perish out there during the 70th week of Daniel, they're going to believe the lie because they receive not the love of the truth. So there is the, there are these, there's two competing systems. The lie and the what? The truth. Now I say all of that because what Paul is demonstrating in 1 Corinthians is that God is pleased, he's delighted in destroying the lie program by revealing the truth. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And so what God is pleased to do is to utilize the foolishness of preaching. Remember, the foolishness of God has nothing to do with God's character, has nothing to do with God's behavior. God does not act foolishly, nor does God possess the character of being a fool. We act foolishly. We do foolish things. But the foolishness of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 125, is God utilizing the means of preaching. That, that's the foolishness of God. It's going to be the preaching, specifically the preaching of the cross. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Paul said a great deal about these words. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Ah, so God has countered the enticing words of man's wisdom with his own system of words, which is built upon the revelation of the truth. Now, why is Paul having to write? all of this down when penning 1 Corinthians. The Corinthians were in grave danger of rejecting the truth program of God. In fact, they're not even in a position to learn the, quote, deep things of God. 
They're in grave danger of rejecting the package of, of revealed truth, the system of revealed truth contained in the words, which we now know are the words of Scripture that God uses to advance the truth. You know what the Corinthians are doing? They're moving away from the truth and the words of truth and they're gravitating towards what? The enticing words of man's wisdom. So for four chapters, Paul is warning the Corinthians. He's, he's uh, exposing what the Corinthians are doing, and he is demonstrating the sheer absurdity in gravitating to the wisdom of of men, and we're not going to go through these four chapters. Go over to chapter 2 and notice verse 9. Now, I just want you to, to sort of get a feel for what Paul is going to do. When Paul warns against the enticing words of man's wisdom, Paul is going to demonstrate in chapter 2, verse 9, the three avenues that human wisdom uses in advocating the lie, in perpetuating the lie, the, the enticing words of man's wisdom is going to utilize three specific areas. Chapter 2, verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Before we, just, just think about this. You know what the lie program utilizes to promote? There you go. It uses the eye gate. Hey, how can I believe in the God that I cannot see? It uses the, we'll, we'll, depending on how much time, the eye gate. It is the approach towards truth based upon this scientific way of figuring things out. Investigative research. You see, the eye gate, that, that has to do with the scientific, empirical way of trying to establish what truth really is. Is that a reliable or safe way of knowing God? See, that's what Paul's warning against. The ear. The ear represents the traditional approach, the religious approach, the cultural approach. Hey, information that has been passed down. And then, of course, you have the heart which is the most dangerous avenue of trying to figure God out. Because, as Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Guess what the Corinthians are beginning to do? They're beginning to use the three avenues that will lead them down the path of spiritual destruction. Rejecting how God, by the way, God does not use the eye, the ear, or the heart. God reveals truth, and he uses a different method. Now, I want you to just appreciate this. Why is Paul referring to Isaiah chapter 64? This is, this is, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 2. Go to Isaiah chapter 64. I, I, this is, to me, the skill. And of course, this is God's word. We understand that. Paul is simply writing the inspired word of God. But the skill in utilizing Isaiah chapter 64, you know what Paul is warning the Corinthians of. Now, Isaiah chapter 64, here is the passage that Paul is referring to, okay? Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God beside thee, what he hath prepared for him 
that waiteth for him. Now, Isaiah 64 ends by referring to those who wait for him. Keep your finger here. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Notice how Paul, how God, records Isaiah 64. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that what? Love. You know what Paul is saying? He is implying the Corinthians don't love God. They think, wait a minute. Don't believers love God? Shouldn't believers love God? Certainly we love God as our Savior. Paul is not dealing with a, a love of God, simply loving God because he saves us from our sins onto eternal life. Paul is talking about verse 6, but howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are what? Perfect. You know what Paul is doing? He's saying, you Corinthians, you, oh wow, chapter 3 says, uh, you're carnal. Remember that? And it's interesting, when Paul describes the carnality at Corinth, he actually ends it by saying, uh, Are ye not carnal and walk as men? The carnality steeped there at Corinth. Listen, you Corinthians, you're walking according to men, according to men's standard, according to the wisdom of the world. And, and Paul is now rebuking them, as John mentioned last evening, uh, you know, all Paul can do is limit his ministry to the foundational truths of Christ Jesus and Him crucified. When Paul's desire, desire was to provide advanced information about the hidden wisdom of God, Paul calls it the deep things of God. But Paul is in, he's not able to provide any of the advanced information uh, and, and revelation concerning the deep things of God. Paul is restricted. When Paul says in chapter 2, verse 9, prepared for them that love him, the Corinthians aren't loving God. Now, how do you love God? I can, we love God because He saves us, but can we love Him in another way? You know, Ephesians chapter 6 talks about those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. How? In all sincerity. You see, you have those that are willing to participate in what God is doing, and then you have those who aren't interested in participating in what God is doing. Paul is implying, you Corinthians don't love God. Now, go back to Isaiah chapter 64, and, and just notice here, it doesn't say to him that love, but for him that waiteth for him. So what you have is God the Holy Spirit who is literally shedding light. What does it mean to wait for him? Paul says to them that love God. You know what it means for a faithful Israelite to wait for God? By the way, there is a parallel. When God provides information and detail, like Daniel chapter 2, to the nation of Israel regarding some future events, the coming Messiah and the coming kingdom and so forth. You know that Israel was expected to also operate by faith. I have not seen, ear heard. You know what? Even in Israel's program, even in the prophetic program, Israel could never have originated, even contemplated what it is that God is going to do with Israel. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor has entered into the heart of man. The things which God has for them that wait, according to Isaiah 64. What does it mean to wait? Go to Psalms chapter 130. Psalms chapter 130. The book of Psalms, a number of times, will actually 
tell us what does it mean to wait on the Lord. But not wait like in, you know, I'm in line at McDonald's and I'm only going to give them 45 seconds to give me my Big Mac. <laughs> to wait means to patiently rely and depend upon what God is saying. Israel was expected to wait, that is, to depend upon the truth that God gave to Israel. Psalms chapter 130, notice there at verse 5. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I what? Hope. Now, for sake of time, Psalms chapter 25, Psalms chapter 27, Psalms chapter 37, over and over again, to wait is to trust in God's word. Because the eye, the ear, the heart is completely unreliable. It is not authoritative. God says, I am telling you what I'm going to do with you, Israel. And I want you to rely upon what I'm telling you. I want you to wait, depend, hope in the truth that I'm giving to you. Now, the long and short of all of that is, did Israel wait? Did they depend on what God was telling Israel about? You know, ultimately, Israel didn't wait. They didn't rely on God's word. And you know what happened as a consequence? The devastating result in not trusting in what God was telling Israel regarding a coming Messiah. What was the tragic consequence? Israel, by following the I, the ear, the heart, they misidentified the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did they do in misidentifying the Lord Jesus Christ? You know what the Corinthians are in danger of doing? They're in danger of misidentifying the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the church, which is his body. The Corinthians are in danger of misidentifying the Lord Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You understand, Paul, he's telling the Corinthians, you got to love God. You love God by loving and valuing his word. And Paul says, I want to give you more of it. And you Corinthians are adopting the very system that the lie program uses to counter what God is doing. The eye, the ear, and the heart. It's a rather startling warning that Paul is issuing. We're going to have to stop. <laughs> Father, we do thank you for your grace. We thank you, Father, that you have revealed truth by your Spirit and that you have a system of doctrine contained in very specific words. And Father, may we love you May we desire to know you. May we continually learn and, and rely upon the information you give to us, regardless of what our eyes see, what, regardless of what our ears are hearing, and, and certainly never dependent upon what we intuitively believe and think about you. May we live by faith. May, may our faith stand not upon the wisdom of men, but in the power of God of God. May we continually just believe what your word teaches as it's been preserved for us in written form. We thank you, Father, for your wisdom. And uh, as we continue on, may we learn more about how to apply it and, and, and how it can be manifested in, in, in our lives. And we ask in Christ Jesus' name.